you're still there, the noise is going on, um, everything's happening, people are there all the 24 hours. You park alongside cars that are worth millions and you think, this is this car that I've hand-built in my little garage and I don't really deserve to be here. Hi everybody, welcome to Horsepower Heritage. I'm Maurice Merrick, and greetings to all of you listening from every point on the compass. This week marks the fourth anniversary of the podcast, and I have to say it has been a very rewarding experience for me to create and produce this show. I've been fortunate to speak with some of the greatest people from all corners of the car culture. Collectors, racers, writers, artists, and I'm excited for the future of the show. I've always got good stuff cooking behind the scenes for you. I usually have about three to four episodes in the production pipeline at any given time, and I try to keep a good variety, and we are never going to run out of stuff to talk about. So if you're new here, I hope it'll become your favorite automotive podcast. But of course, it's more than that. We talk about motorcycles and all sorts of racing, land speed, Formula One, drag racing, and even aviation and aerospace from time to time. You can also find Horsepower Heritage on Instagram and now TikTok, and there's a YouTube channel. The latest video is a quick look at the 1933 Auto Union Type 52 Schnell Sportwagen. Have you seen this thing? It's basically a hypercar inspired by the Auto Union Silver Arrow Grand Prix racing cars. The plans were drawn up in 1933, but it was never built for obvious reasons. But recently, Audi dusted off the drawings and finally made it a reality, and it's pretty incredible. So check out that video on YouTube. I try to do a video each month over there, by the way. So subscribe to the channel. I've got interviews, projects, collections, coverage of car events, and a lot of other good stuff for you. Now, speaking of the Auto Union Type 52, which is a fairly faithful execution of the period design, Today's episode is all about another unusual one-of-one machine, the Cunningham Cadillac Le Monster that raced in the 24 Hours of Le Mans in 1950. Briggs Cunningham, of course, an American sportsman, very wealthy, and went racing in Europe and America's Cup winner in 1958, and he was a constructor. He built his own racing cars, mostly with Chrysler Hemi engines, but uh, early on it was the Cadillac 331, which is what we're going to talk about today. And the original Le Monster is now in the care of the Revs Institute in Naples, Florida. And, you know, that car is too historically significant to ever actually race again. You may see it do parade laps here and there. But a talented gentleman racer from England has carefully built a replica of Le Monster, and he's been ripping it up in vintage racing. His name is Derek Drinkwater, and he's here to tell you all about it. You can follow Derek on Instagram, by the way, at DerekDrinkwater48. You've got to check it out. He's a skilled guy in so many ways and super down to earth. Now, if you enjoy the podcast, do me a favor, share it with a friend. Most podcast apps have a built-in share feature. All you've got to do is find that icon and tap it and send the episode to a friend. And it's a great way to help me grow the audience. All right, stay right there because I've got Derek Drinkwater and his Cunningham Le Monster special. It's a great story. And that's coming up right after this. Hi guys, Maurice Merrick here, and I want to let you know about three great scale models available right now at ModelCitizenDieCast.com. First, there's the pocket size Lancia Stratos HF Stradale in 164th scale by Mini GT. Or how about a BMW 3.0 CS Coupe in 143rd scale by Mini Champs in your choice of three different colors. Or if American muscle is more your style, how about the 1968 Shelby GT500 convertible in great big 118th scale by Acme Trading Company. It's finished in Acapulco blue with white racing stripes. And boy oh boy, check out those mag wheels. 
models. You can find all of these and more at ModelCitizenDieCast.com. Use the promo code HERITAGE at checkout and get 10% off your order. Limitations apply. From race cars to street cars and everything in between, it's Model Citizen Diecast. Because your inner child still wants to play with cars. Derek Drinkwater, I have to tell you how much I admire what you've built here. And this is a genius move because this car, Le Monster, is familiar to everyone who's interested in vintage racing and Le Mans history and who knows Briggs Cunningham, who was a very important figure in sports car racing in the United States and Europe in the early 50s. So the car is unmistakable, and yet there's it's one of one. And the reason this is a genius move, not just because of those factors, but because under the skin, Le Monster is a, basically a stock 1950 Cadillac. And so in a way, it was more affordable to go this direction rather than to try to replicate you know, uh, an early Ferrari or an Aston Martin. And yet the cachet and the excitement of this car is uh, probably every bit as much as those could have been. So I'm so excited to hear your story. You mentioned the Revs Institute. And they are fantastic folks and really committed to preservation of of all of this stuff. Did they charge you for their services at all? No. The, the revs were, when I spoke to them and said, I want to build the car, they basically said, we'll find whatever we can. And any information we get, we, get, we will pass it on to you. And then emails come through, photographs, even stuff where... I even got some information what they've got on board from when the drivers actually raced and what revs they were doing, what gear they were in at different corners. So for me, the whole journey was um, the racing is always a great thing, but it's a journey to get there. So once we started building the car, it was to re- recreate as many things as possible. So we wanted the car to look like the original. And we're very critical to, if any posts come up on the internet, to quickly say, no, that's not the original, that's a replica and that's our one. Because what we don't want to do is have any crossover. Um, the one that we built is also, there's a couple of things one of the things that's different is the roll bar behind your head is two inches taller and two inches wider because we are racing it today. And you know, I've been in spins and you know, we've got to look at the safety, which is paramount for everything for racing. Um, so there's a couple of things different. But to build it, um, the revs gave me ideas that I didn't even think that we were going to do. Things like they told me the date when they started building the cars originally. And as it, as we started, I want to replicate that. I wanted to do it. They took five months. So the original was five months and they raced it. I wanted to build it in those five months. And we eventually did build it in five months and we got to race it. So all this was a bonus from when we started to build it that I'd never realized going down the journey of building this car, I I built a galaxy and I built other stuff, but this car took on its own, its own feel to it for us because replicating the gauges. And once we started to put shouts out for different things, uh, one of the gauges, the Stuart Warner gauges. So the monster has Stuart Warner gauges with the wings, which are all aircraft gauges. And then as we started to unfold the information that was given to us, you know, it's an aircraft company that built the car. And then I could understand how they come across with some of the gauges, with the way they were doing it. And if you give me a Ferrari, I might not do, be able to do the panels for it. But to do the panels on the Monster is all old school. So to build it and make it, in in my mind it was it was you know i'm not saying it was easy but it was just one step after the other and to build it and to do it on my own was part of the buzz and other people were hearing 
what we were doing, one of the things was one of the gauges, which is the rev counter, is quite a rare clock. We couldn't find one. And then eventually we found one and someone wanted like $2,000. And we put a shout out on the ham. And the guys on the ham are absolutely fantastic. Someone messaged us and he said, I've got one of those suckers, he said. Um, he said, you could have it for what I paid for it umpteen years ago. We were like, yeah, okay, we'll have it. And he said, I paid a hundred bucks for it. <laughs> Is it a Stuart Warner gauge? That's it, yes. And he, what he, what, the email that come back, we, we showed him what we showed him photographs of what we'd done. And he emailed back and he said, I'm only too pleased to be involved in the build. And that, is everyone wanted to have something with it. it's it's like a a community build right it's because what you're doing is really resonating with like-minded people and that's a wonderful thing yes so sorry go ahead i i interrupted um no no so so the the whole idea of building a car took a different form of me not just building a car to race at le mans it was me building a car that involved other people Although I was doing the work, people were following us, um, suggesting things and getting involved. So although it was a car that we could afford to build, it was now a car that involved other people in some way. And going back to the revs, we sent them photographs of what we were doing and how we were doing it. And they um, were on board with it. And for us... That that was you know I've seen I've seen the the the, the cries of the C four and the C four KR that have been built recently or recently a little while ago, and they're works of art. But as we started as we started to build the car and learn about it, and the bodywork for me, once we built the car, I took hammer to it, and then dented the panels because so I wanted it to look like. It was old. But the information that was stored at the revs, I couldn't have done it. Yes, I could have built a car, but it wouldn't necessarily have been a car that some people would mistake for the original. Even the carb setup, they gave me a sheet of paper, which was an order that uh, Holly had to take the intake manifold with a center carb and then just do four carbs on the outside. And I looked at the worksheet. I looked at the drawing, I just sat it on the bench and just started drilling holes in it. So it was like a child with Meccano or yeah, or Lego or something. Um, and I could get my head around everything they'd done. I'm not a panel man. Um, so I'm not a specialist in English wheels or anything. And I watched all the, the videos of you know, how people do an English wheel and how they roll metal. And there's a few bits on the car that need rolling, the wheel arches, the air scoops. And my first time, I, I'd taken, I made myself a sand mat and got a hammer and I beat hell out of it and I pull it in the wheel and it ended up being flat again. And then eventually, after a few goes, I made one, phoned my mate and I said, uh, come and have a look at this, you know, pop down over the evening, I've made one. And he said, yep, yeah, that's perfect. He said, but the trouble is now you've got to build a second one that looks identical to that, which took me a bit longer. But it was, I took five months and it was something that I needed to get out of my system. And the way it was built was very crude, but in its time, it was the first, and we believe it's the first car to go in a wind tunnel. Interesting. A, a couple of months ago, I did see, and I've not managed to track it down, I think I saw, because it wasn't a full-life wind tunnel, it was like a model wind tunnel. And I saw one, if anyone's out there can find it, the Reds would probably love to have it. It was about two metres long, had a chop out in the middle, and it had a, uh, a model of the monster right in the middle, looked like it was on a stick. And they must have blow, blew air and smoke. So... From what I understand, it was the first car to go in a wind tunnel, especially an American car, first car to have two-way radio, first car to run overhead V8, overhead valve from a V8 
for a race and possibly the first production car. Well, and let's give a little bit of background. So the in 1949, Cadillac was first to market in the United States with an overhead valve V8 engine, the 331 cubic inch V8. So it became the choice for racing for a number of people, not not, not the least of which was Briggs Cunningham, but also Sidney Allard, uh, you know, uh, and, and others. We should probably give a little bit of background on Briggs Cunningham. He is a very familiar figure to many people, but he was an Ohioan. He was, he was the scion of a wealthy family. They made their fortune through Citizens National Bank, the Pennsylvania Railroad, Procter & Gamble, which was a soap company and is, is, you know, is this major corporation throughout the 20th century. And he was what we call a sportsman. And we don't really we don't really use that term for people today. But if you were cynical, you might say he was an he was idle rich. Right. Except he wasn't. He was a very active person. He was kind of living life to the fullest. Uh, He attended Yale University where he became friends with the Collier brothers, one of whom was called Miles. Now, fast forward, Miles Collier, Jr., is the man behind the Revs Institute. So this is a long family affair. And when Briggs Cunningham passed away, I think in the late 1990s, early 2000s, his collection went to the Revs Institute. And I believe it essentially formed the basis of the Revs Institute. Yeah, it's a backbone. So that is kind of the thumbnail sketch of the history here. And La Monster and the Petit Petard, right? The, uh, yep. Silly. Yeah. The, the stock Cadillac sedan, they took these two cars to Le Mans in 1950. And the reason Cunningham wanted special bodywork on the car was, and you touched on it. He wanted aerodynamics and he wanted to lighten the car. So to make it more competitive, those two things. And remarkably it finished 11th, even with, um, a gearbox failure. It, I think they had top gear for the last portion of the race, but n- nothing but top gear. That's it. It, uh, it had, well, what basically happened is, um, at some point in the race, and I can't remember it's 30 minutes in or something, um, a dog run out in front of them. He swerved to miss the dog, got stuck in the sand. And there was this thing prior to the race. He, everyone was told to take a shovel. He refused to take a shovel because he said, got no room, not having a shovel. Um, And when he got stuck in the sand, the French wanted to help him get the dig the car out. But if that would have happened, he would have been disqualified. So he spent 30 minutes digging the car out. So if we take a little bit of poetic justice, and I've seen the times of the racing. um, If you take the third gear only and the stuck in the sand for 30 minutes it could have came second with a little bit of imagination and that may have been a whole different thing but even so both cars to get the sign you know they're the biggest cars out there in racing the the saloon is two ton um, which is something like four thousand pounds i think it is um the monster is three thousand pounds three thousand seven hundred twenty five so they are ginormous cars, um, and stopping them is a challenge. But he he's taken two cars that has performed, um, and and uh, going. Why I believe the French love the Americans so much, which is something that I've recently found out, is that the Americans liberated Le Mans. They were the first troops to get to Le Mans to liberate them. So when the Americans come back in 1950 with the Cadillacs, like the Americans come back again. So they were waving, cheering as the cars went round. Yes, I think if I'm not mistaken, Derek, the Germans, uh, they built a work camp, I think. Yeah. A detention camp. Yeah. And so and so when the troops, when the Americans arrived, they found people locked up yeah so they they liberated and and it's a lot of these uh, the monsters given us snippets are to a lot both cars in actual fact have given us snippets to a lot of 
things that people have met, met us and said, you know, did you know this? This happened. My father was this. So the pair of the cars take people down a memory lane. You and has introduced us to people that we'd never would imagined we would have spoke to or connected with. Um, so him building these two cars is quite a big thing in history because although the cars didn't run, they only raced once at Le Mans, and although they didn't race again, it led him on a journey to then to build, I think the 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 C three, and then when he went into the C four. And Cadillac was not interested. The Chrysler gave him engines. So it then developed the Chrysler. So if he wouldn't have gone down this history, we may have not ever had the Chrysler engine. So the what this has opened up is someone's foresight for developing race cars. And I'm not sure if people, all the people know how much he was involved in developing you know, and Collier as well, the race cars and the car industry. Yeah, that's right. And in fact, one could argue that Cunningham's influence on Chrysler Corporation really kind of was the maybe the seed of the horsepower wars of the 1950s because that that Hemi V8 uh, came out before the small block Chevrolet engine, before the Ford Y block. And pretty soon, all of the big three were competing for who could have the most powerful engine. So if it's not the exact pinpoint of the start of the horsepower wars, it certainly contributed. And another piece of trivia I got to mention, people know about the Shelby GT350 Mustang. One of the signature colors for that car was Wimbledon white with blue stripes. Now, people call those shelby stripes but really they're cunningham stripes because briggs cunningham was the first to do it uh when he took le monster to le mans it was painted white which was the national racing color of the united states every uh competing nation had their own national color so the americans wore white and he put blue stripes on the car so those that's the origin of that paint livery which was continued by carol shelby who also had raced at le mans in 1959 driving the aston martin dbr1 victorious with his uh partner roy salvadori so lots of history here yeah it's so for us the whole journey um of building the car is more than just going racing you know, trying to re- recreate the air ducts to keep the brakes cool and work out what they've done. Once we built it, I'm driving a car that, you know, this guy that I admire raced in 1950. So our car is 160 brake horse, as was the original. It run five carbs. The, it, the original had upgraded coil suspension, uh, upgraded anti-roll bar. Okay. With today's brakes, we've got better material, so I'm running that. Um, the rear springs are still 1950 Cadillac. We've got an open differential, so I have wheel spin at every bend. We've got three seats of LaSalle gearbox, so that's on the column, so it's three on the tree. I don't use first gear. It's only second and third. Um, uh, steering is like steering a powerboat, an inboard powerboat. I had, I raced it at Brands Hatch and this one guy phoned me up and he said, Derek, he said, I've watched you racing. And he said, the only thing I can describe it is a series one Land Rover going at high speed. <laughs> he said, you were on that steering wheel left and right before you even got to the bend. Um, today, if the Cadillac, both Cadillacs are in a 1950s race only, they're quick cars. But we're racing at Le Mans. We're from 49 to 57. So you've got the C4 going past me, probably 70 mile an hour faster on the straight. You've got the Mercedes and they're, they're flying. But having saying that, so we're doing about 125 down the Molson straight. I've never revved it any higher than four and a half thousand revs because the original... And we've had an original engine 
in the car. We've never had a new build engine. The engines that we've had up until recently have all been second-hand engines that have all been a tired 160 brake horse. So 125, 4,500 revs um, down the straight, and the car goes light. So, but it, in fairness, the company built airplanes. So for them, at that point, the, both cars are like chalk and cheese. Built a monster, it goes light, but you turn into that corner and you're into the corner. Um, you're hard on the brakes. You've got, you struggle to get in second gear because there's no, no synchro. And it's just something that's romantic about it. And it's not, it's not, you know, a Mustang. It's not a GT. It's not a Frog. And of course it goes light because this is an era before they understood downforce, before they understood ground effect, really. So, yeah, at speed, it's going to lift. Your steering's going to get light. By the way, I, in case people haven't seen this car, the only thing I can maybe describe it as, it's almost like an aluminum Halliburton suitcase on wheels. I mean, it's a big slab sided flat top. It's like an aircraft carrier in a, uh, I mean, the front end of it is completely flat. Uh, it's got these big headlights that are staring at you. The, there's quite a bit of overhang uh, over the, over the wheels. Right. And the, the track of the car is fairly wide as it is, but then you have that overhang. So it's a very imposing machine. It, it's, it's something I, I think, the best way to describe it is Star Wars, when you first see Luke uh, Skywalker in that hover craft. The land speeder. That's it. Um, and, but they were building this in a rush, and it didn't need to look pretty, and it just needed to do the job. And for that year, it did the job. And for me, building it... Um, replicating it with all the information we were given little things like rear lights and 1948 ford lights which we put in we've got some white big fog lights or spotlights at the back i never knew what they were for because why do we need great big headlights facing backwards um even the horn the horns come from a 1948 truck i put 1948 you know truck horns on so the whole thing was trying to get it as close as possible. Yeah, there were some bits that were hard, but it was just a bit at a time replicating the seats. And there's key things that people always see. They will see the seats, the gauges, the steering wheel. Um, then when you open the hood, you've got five carburetors. They, they run the original radiator. Once we built it, then we had to get it FIA inspected. The FIA are pretty strict on what cars can and can't be and how they're built. And when they came and inspected the car, they could have a look at the one we built, one we've got a stock, and then look at the other one, and they could see that we've replicated it the same. So once we got the paperwork, we were all to go. But originally, Cunningham took the Le Monster to France. They spent a day, I believe, inspecting the car. Because there wasn't, at that point, there wasn't any information saying you couldn't rebody a car, but there wasn't any information saying you could. So what he was doing was a little bit out of the box, because it has to had, had to have one door, had to have two seats, had to have somewhere to take a spare tire, and had to have all working lights. So from the car side of it, once they inspected it, they could see that he'd, he'd spent a long time getting it right. And Derek, you mentioned an aircraft company. There was a Grumman aircraft company engineer who Briggs Cunningham hired to work on the body, right? Yeah. yeah. So if you look at a, an airplane fuselage and then stretch it, you know, stretch it out, that's what the front of the car looks like. Stick a propeller on it, and that's what the front of the car looks like. And then on the back, all the boys in the factory, I believe, were, invo would, were involved doing boats. So that's why we've also got the boat tail, which if you stuck a couple of wings on it and squashed it, you've got an airplane fuselage. And then once we got the car inspected, going to Le Mans, 
um, I'd never raced at Le Mans before. So I'm going to a track now that I've never raced for. I practice on the PlayStation. And I was so shocked with the people from France. It was a little bit embarrassing, really, because you just imagine you're in a paddock. Our car does not fit in the tent in the paddock. So it sticks out about three foot. Everyone else is inside. We're, we're nearly, what, 17 foot long. So, um, and every time you, you park alongside cars that are worth millions and you think, this is this car that I've hand built in my little garage and I don't really deserve to be here. But all the French people were just so excited to see this car that we spent most of the time talking to people. Things like we had a guy that came up his father took photographs of the original in 1950. So of crossing, so that was a photograph of the original car crossing the finish line in 1950, which is the only photograph anyone's got. And he gave us that photograph. Wow. You, I don't care whether it's, you know, at the moment, the, most of the racing I seem to be doing, I always seem to be the oldest, the biggest and the heaviest. But it doesn't matter because what it is is a crowd pleaser. And... Le Mans, they just loved it. And we, we had an issue in one of the races where halfway through the night, we did the first race and our engine started to get hot. And I knew there was something wrong with it. And I came in the pit lane and it stalled and that was it. And we had a spare engine, another worn, worn out engine, you know, sort of stock, um, what, what you'd say, a cutout. So it was now a second-hand car. And I saw I had disagreement with my pit crew because they sort of said, oh, you had four years to get this engine sorted and you're still... But that's racing. Um, so I set to getting this engine out and everyone thought we had... Le Mans, there's, for those who don't know, it's, although it's a 24-hour, you don't race for 24 hours. You race... There's several plateaus with different year cars and you simulate the 24 hours. So we race sort of, I know, five o'clock in the afternoon, then 12 o'clock at night, and then maybe eight, depending how it works. So you do four hours over the 24. Yeah. You're sort of taking um, a slice of each phase of the, the 20, the 24 hour race, right? You see uh, changes in the weather, obviously track conditions. Uh, it, it's no, it gets notoriously foggy at times. Some some years it can be blazing hot, and some years it can be chilly. So yeah, and I I, I think what they they've done is fantastic because you've got over a thousand cars from the pre war cars right up to a later still classic, but you've got GT forties, you've got you know going all the way through the field of different classes. Um, so and even just simulating, you're still there. The noise is going on. Um, everything's happening. People are there all the 24 hours. We'll get right back to the show, but I want to take a moment to ask for your help. If you enjoy the podcast, then please consider supporting Horsepower Heritage with a donation. For instance, how about a dollar an episode? That's just $2 a month, and that helps me continue bringing you the stories and interviews you enjoy. Go to buymeacoffee.com forward slash HP Heritage. And join other fans in supporting the show with a donation. That's buymeacoffee.com forward slash HP Heritage. Thanks for your support. And now back to the show. So, so we were then pulling this engine. So everyone thought I was going to miss the next race and then do the morning race. And I managed to pull the engine out within four hours, get it back in and make the next race as they were blowing the whistle. And the racing was iconic. Um, it was something that is on, on my bucket list all the time. But out of all that, the main thing that I remember was all the second drivers and the mechanics. And the paddock is quite a big square area, and there's a circle that you then drive out to. Stayed. And I was the last one out. So I was still getting in my having something to eat, having something to drink, in my race suit. And so I was the last one out. And everyone stayed that didn't need to be anywhere and all cheered as I came out to go onto the track. Because all those guys could see that I worked hard 
to try and get the car done for the next race. So it's just not about the racing. Um, I've never owned a car that I've just bought and gone and raced. So everything I've had, I've had to build, work, look after. It's all on a budget. That year, we didn't finish the race. Last lap, we had the accelerator cable go. I was going to pull the bonnet, jam the accelerator cable over open, and just go like hell. Um, and I tried to explain to the marshal that I was in a safe place and I needed to fix the car, which you're allowed to do as long as you're in a safe place. But he didn't really understand English, and we didn't get that opportunity. He wouldn't allow me to do that. So there was tears. Um, and when we did the race last year, which is the first time we finished with the Monster, and the car was going really well, and I kept it at 4,500 revs, and I wanted to go faster to see what the car would do. We'd come into the pit stop and gone off. Pat gave me a drink, and she said, right, yeah, you know, you do this, go out there. We've just got, you know, half the race to do, and we've, we've, we're finished. And I went out, and I started to go up to five, five and a half grand. Yes, it's all about racing and going fast. But at that point, this is about the car. And I brought it back down to four and a half thousand revs to make sure we finished, because the car needed to finish the race. And that's my mechanic side of it, thinking I need to look after what I'm driving. It was about finishing. And that ticks a big box for me because I've now driven a replica and finished at Le Mans. One of our the clubs that we race in in England, the CSCC, were invited to take a number of British people to Daytona. We spoke to them and said, look, would Daytona have us? Because Daytona is for cars from 1965 onwards, not for 1950. So there was a lot of discussion go back and forth, and they said, we'd love to have you come to America. And for us, it was a special thing because we knew the origin, both originals had never raced in America. So the American public have not really seen, I call it their own car, though ours is a replica, their own car, race. So we decided to take the monster to Daytona. So we were the, yet again, the biggest, the heaviest, and the only one on drum brakes. And there are no Cadillac badges on the car. I mean, it's not as if you can look at it and know immediately what it is. No, no. There's one little crest on the, on the front, and that's it. Um, and then we get to Daytona, the, the big house, which Le Mans was scary. Daytona was scary, but in different formats. And you can see why they call it the big house. It actually scared me quite a lot going up on that walk. We did the, the walk on the bank and I'm thinking, I'm two ton, you know, nearly two ton going up on this bank. It's never going to stay up there. Um, and then when we get on the track and we were going on behind the pace car, I actually steered that much up the hill up on the bank that I'm thinking it felt like I was going sideways. I think we did a two, two minute 36 lap. We were doing at four and a half thousand revs or just over four and a half thousand revs because we've got slightly bigger tires on than Le Mans. So at just over four and a half thousand revs, we were doing 136 mile an hour. And as you come off the bank and under the start line, that's where I started to break before we come on the infield. So not at the 300 meter mark, not at the 400 meter mark, actually out at that speed is out further. But we did the first race. And we're about a lap before the end. And on the infield, as I came into the bend, um, it felt like I had a flat tire. I didn't hit the tires, but I was up against the wall. I managed to come to a stop. We then had a recovery truck pick us up. Then I quickly realized it wasn't a flat tire because all the tires, the car was rolling. So we got the car in the garage. We took the, wheel, took the what do you would call it, a uh, wheel cover, the spat, the skirt of the car. Um, took it off and the wheel and the hub fell off. Someone said it's a bearing. I said, no, it's not a bearing because what had happened is you've got the wheel hub has got your bearing and then I call it a flange around the outside that holds the wheel on. That flange had separated from the wheel and never seen that before. And one of the mechanics who was with us started to go, there was a swap meet outside the stadium, so went out there 
We then phoned Napa, O'Reilly's, all of the, you know, but where do you get a 1950 you know, um, front hub? So the stadium put a shout out because they had the live feed to anyone that was watching. Has anyone got one in Florida? So at this time, we thought we'd, that's it, we're finished. I got one of the guys actually welded the hub up for us. And then there was a lady that's friend, I believe her friend messaged her and said, there's a car on Facebook. So they managed to find the link. So this guy was advertising a car on Facebook for 800 bucks, complete car, wreck. We then contacted him on Facebook and said, look, it's eight o'clock at night. You're a hundred miles away. You know, can I have the address? Can I come and buy the car? We just need, you know, some bits. So he said, yes, sir. He gave me the address. We went off. We, it was nine, I think it was nine, just over 95 miles away. We get to him at, I don't know, 10 o'clock at night. And by this time, he has messaged the lady and she's told him what was happening, what car we're doing, and he's read up about us. And then I say to him, right, I don't need the car, but I'm willing to give you 800 bucks. I just need the hub. I can't take the car away. He said, the car's not for sale, sir. So me and my friend look at each other. And I said, well, can I at least buy the hub? He said, no, sir. So at that point, we're wondering, we've come all this way and he's not letting us have it. Then he turns around and says, but you can have the part. I don't want no money. So we were like blown away. And he was so chuffed to be involved yet again. Um, we took the part off, put the old part on. We got back. I was messaging the track saying, well, I don't think we're out of it yet. You know, is it okay? If, you know, and they said, yeah, everything's cool. And then we managed to do the next, we missed one race and we did the night race. By the way, I have to tell you a story. Steve McQueen and a guy named Vic Hickey, who was a GM engineer, built a car called the Baja Boot. And you may be familiar with it, but it was an off-road racer. Uh, it looks like a buggy, right? But that car had... Oldsmobile front wheel drive and they were racing that car. I want to say it was either the mint 400 or the stardust off-road race in Las Vegas. And they broke the, uh, the CV joint in the front end and they pulled one off of an Oldsmobile in the parking lot to repair it. I mean, the same, the same kind of deal, right? But yet again, although the racing was awesome, it's a journey that, is the most powerful for me. It is. It is. You know, he loved the idea that he was involved in our car. Um, once we did Daytona, um, we left the car in uh, Florida, and we had this idea that we wanted to drive across America in it, and we hadn't really, we were at home at that stage back in England. We hadn't really given it much thought at that point. And then as we're planning what we're doing, we said, well, if we're going to drive the monster back across America, we need to end with a race. We're going to do hotels. But then we've got race tire. We've got a jack. We've got equipment. Not lots of equipment. I mean, it's just a toolbox, but it's a few bits. And we sort of thought, well, if we do a support car, then we've got to stop. And we just wanted to do something. We wanted to have an adventure. So then we decided to buy a teardrop caravan, um, a little eight foot by four foot thing. But then the, it's a race car, so we've got no tow hitch. So I then build the tow hitch from photographs of the original car at home, all adjustable. I make some airbags that can go under the springs. So when we get there, we then well, we had to drill a couple of holes in the car, but it all fitted and it all worked. We got our teardrop. And then we went and started on this journey. We left Florida in the morning. It was freezing cold. Pat had two coats on. Now, the monster's got no heater, got no roof, and no wipers. It is bare essentials. So we go on this journey, and we get to garages, and people want to take photographs. You know, we had one guy follow us for a few miles. He just wanted us to stop so he could take photographs of the car and find out what it was. We put a little sticker on the side of the car with Facebook and Instagram, follow us. And the response has been phenomenal Derek I'll put a link in the show notes so you and Pat here you are towing 
this teardrop trailer behind the Cadillac across the United States from Florida to California. And your destination is Laguna Seca, right? Yes. Um, the idea at the start of the journey was to end the journey on a race. But we didn't know whether the car was going to, we were going to have one car in, you know, we were going to have a car in one piece or the suspension or anything. So we spoke to the SVRA and they were nice enough to turn around and say, if you turn up on the day, we'll accept you. So, which was great for us. Um, but also we did Route 66. So we went off piece a little bit. We had about 100 miles of road that uh, kept pulling the gear shifter out because of the bouncing up and down. So then we had to, we were holding the gear in. We did Grand Canyon. So there's lots of other stuff that we, we did on the way that was just unreal to see the American countryside. Because though we'd done the trip before, it's so vast. And part of our journey was to sort of let some of the people, our friends know, not to show, say to people, look what we're doing, but look at what's out there. Look what you can do if you, you know, you can do the same as we can in any car and to take people on a journey with us. So the idea of racing a Laguna was just quite wild. And although we raced Daytona, Daytona is just a different thing, you know, with the bank and everything. Um, so we get to Daytona, they get to Laguna and it's another one of those tracks like Le Mans. You know, there, there's a number of tracks out there that you wouldn't believe you'd ever get to race at. But yet again, because of the monster, we're now racing somewhere that I could only dream of. You know, there's no, nothing in history that, you know, if you do, if you do a GT40 or a, a Mustang or a Cobra, you can look on the history books and see what times people are doing and how fast they're going but the monster is just every track we do is a whole new can of worms our friend rob manson he's raced there with pebble beach race etc a lot of times in his years and he said what we're going to do is i've got a map and i'm going to talk you through it as you would learn the tracks and he said you go into this corner and you do this in second gear and you do this in third gear and then you then come up to the corkscrew, and as you turn into the corkscrew, he said, look for, the, look for the second oak tree. So, and everyone said, you know, as you get into that corkscrew, look for that oak tree. That's where you need to be heading. So, so for those who don't know, so as you turn hard left, it gets to a point where it drops so steep that you can't see the track. And there's a row of trees in the background. And they all say, look for the second oak tree. Now, I did the qualify, I did the practice, and I came in, and it was the first time I've ever been on new tyres with a monster, because we do hand-me-downs. But the hand-me-downs I were on, I was given the hand-me-down tyres from a friend of ours that raced at Spa 6 Hour. I used those at Le Mans. I then did a couple of track days. I then drove from Fort Lauderdale to Daytona and then raced with those tyres. We changed one of the tyres because we had an issue and then I drove, or we drove, 3,600 miles with all the detours to Laguna and then we put a brand new set of tyres on. So I've never had the monster with new tyres so the first practice on a track that I've never been on was quite scary because the tyres were like really fresh. Um... And I came in and Pat said, uh, okay, how was it? How was the corkscrew? And I said, well, someone must have pruned that stuff in tree because I could not see it. <laughs> um, and she said, what do you mean? And I said, well, you know, we had this talk. Rob gave me this talk. Other people have gave me the talk all about seeing this second oak tree. What they're forgetting is I sit, considering I sit quite low. And from my front um, fender all the way to my seat, it's just over eight feet. I said, I'm still going, I'm going up as we get to that. And I can't see the trees. So the only way I worked out is at one point in the track, if I can see the control tower on my left hand side, I know I'm in the right place. If I can't see it, then I'm not turned in further enough. So I said, that's the only way I could work it out. Yeah. You needed a different point of reference. It's steep. And it's like going over the falls in a barrel. Incidentally, one of my favorite 
things to do is to grab a, a lawn chair and a cold beer and sit under the oaks at the corkscrew and watch cars come through there. It's it's great fun. Yeah, and and you hear them come over there in a gear and then they they're powering all the way through and absolutely fantastic. In the monster, you're going up that that steep hill in third gear. You come into that chicane and you're in second gear. But that much weight dropping over that bank, I don't really need second gear. So you, you're accelerating and the torque has gone because the weight has taken over going down that hill. And it's just nothing with the monster gives me, you know, the, I call it the chat where people tell you what you should be doing at a race, a racetrack. And the monster sort of has its own place it needs to be, your own place it's got to break. You can't use second gear sometimes because it takes so long. If you're, if you're in a rush, if you're trying to get on it, it takes so long to change gear. And Derek, that gearbox, you mentioned it was a LaSalle gearbox. It's like a 1940 gearbox, right? Yeah, I, well, I believe they started doing them in 36, um, all the way up right up till 50-something. Um, there are no parts for them today. You can't buy new parts. Um, Board Warner didn't take them on as in re-replicating parts. So the cell box is sort of much of a um, a dinosaur. And we are three on the tree. And it takes so long to change gear up box and down box. There's no quick shifting. There's no heel toe. This, this is not... You know, if you get out of a modern car and jump into the monster, it, it's a, a whole different ball game. And there's quite a bit of linkage there because it is a three on the tree, so it's quite a bit of travel to get it from one gear to the next. Is, that's quite funny because when we did a couple of practices and then a qualifier, the guy who does the uh, start flag and the finish flag, he came up in the paddock and he said, uh, you know, I've been watching the car. He said, oh, it's amazing. I've, I've read about the history because I never knew about the history. But he said, why are you waving to me all the time? Every time you go past, you're waving. And I sort of, I laughed and I said, no, sir. I said, I'm changing gear <laughs> because I'm having to put my hand and go right up. So every time I, that's my, from coming out of that corner, it takes so long to get into second gear. That's where I'm changing and then as you just get past that, you're nearly then, you're into third, but then you think, God, I'm back into second gear again because I'm 400 meters out. I'm braking hard to get around the next corner. Well, listen, Derek, I can't tell you how much I admire what you and Pat have done with the car thus far. I mean, all of the racing, not to mention the cross-country road trip. And to think that you're going to do it now again this summer, west to east across America, stopping at uh, Road America and Watkins Glen. You're going to give the crowds quite a thrill. Uh, if people want to follow you, by the way, they can find you on Instagram and Facebook at Derek Drinkwater 48. And I'll put a link in the show notes. That's fantastic. But um, it's wonderful to be on your show. And we're, we're chuffed that we can hopefully have people on board like yourselves that will follow our journey and um, to get to see. So that, that's an amazing trip. There's more to Derek's story, so come back for part two of our discussion. That'll be this Friday, August 2nd. Until then, I'm Maurice Merrick. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.